Hello and welcome to episode 97 part 1 of Awesome Astronomy for July 2020. Well here we are again, the never ending cycle of existence, spinning by on the merry-go-round of life, clinging tightly to a fake plastic horse named Murd. Each lap a little less fun than the one before, and already you're bored of waving at your parents who have given up looking anyway and have f***ed off to the coffee concession to wonder again why they forgot a condom that drunken night in Malaga. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is repeated. Neon clothes are back. Baking your own bread is back. NASA launching two people in a capsule to low Earth orbit is back. It's as if we're trapped in the late 20th century, sentenced to forever repeat it, rickrolled by history. <laughs> and so it is with society. The pressure cooker of rights and equality has once again exploded. The lid of apathy has once again yeeted itself into the air and the centuries-old stew of anger, injustice and demand for fairness has spilt themselves all over the manicured lawns of those who didn't even know there was a cook-up happening. But unfortunately, the lid will go back on. It always does. It's like Groundhog Day, except Punk's attorney Phil is a right-wing twat who pro-offers a few crumbs of change, a few hollow whispered platitudes, and tells us all once again to repeat the cycle. Phil says another few decades of winter, people, then we can all meet angrily again and do this all again. <laughs> We never seem to fully solve the injustices, and at the urging of those in charge, just grab hold of that sh horse and ride round and around, hoping the next lap will be better than the last. But the fat man with the overly fake tan, flattening his hubristic hair while he fumbles with his lever, doesn't care, as he fingers his bulging money belt and laughs at the gullible saps who are lining up for yet another go. But turning away from the steaming pile flying headlong towards the rotational air mover that is the current world situation, we once again take an elegant dive from the top board and plunge into the cool, refreshing pool of astronomy and science, and perhaps for a while we can pretend that the world is rational and balanced. Though, judging by my co-hosts, this could be an uphill battle, as I introduce the ever unbalanced Jenny... <laughs> <laughs> Brains! And the unquestionably insane Ralph! <laughs> 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 right... Hello, how the devil are you people? <laughs> Better than you? What's happened to you, Paul? You, you yeah. are decidedly down this month. I know. I was, I was, I was channeling me in a cynic this morning, I was putting that together. <laughs> Just, what can you do? What can you do? Look at the world. Does the world really seem that grim? <laughs> oh, it does at the moment. But there we go. <laughs> So, um, what, what, have we, what have you been up to? What, what's, what's going on? Well, my paper draft is finished. Ooh. We've now sent to the co-authors, and one of the co-authors is like, oh, I want to show it to like a bunch of other people to get their opinions on it. And it's like, why though? It's done. Why do we want to show it to even more people and have even more people go, I think we should change this sentence here, and then have even more co-authors and more people that you have to please. And, and so... that's right, is it? That if, if somebody just changes a word in there, or not, not the punctuation, but if they add a word in or take a word out, they then become a co-author. I mean, not quite literally a word, but on my first paper, I had a couple of co-authors that largely did uh, grammatical changes and suggestions and stuff like that, rather than science stuff. So yes, wow. there are political no. reasons sometimes that people get to be co-authors on papers. Wow. This is this is why there's a lot of talk of, of the whole system of peer review and everything is actually slightly broken, isn't mm. it? This is... The, pol the internal politics of peer review and, and how you're getting name yeah. on papers and yeah yeah while the, while the principle of peer review is good the system that is created to do it is not actually very good yeah I think a big issue with peer review is that obviously it's very important and it needs to be done but there's never any kind of like monetary compensation for when you do peer review someone's work mm -hmm. you know because that it does mm -hmm. take days out of your schedule to review someone's mm. work and the mm. whole idea is that it's tit for tat in the sense of for every paper that you submit and get reviews you should be willing to then review a paper in return mm. but you know you might submit a paper yeah. that's four pages long and then you might be asked to review one that's like 40 pages long and it's you know that's clearly yeah. not fair um and and this is this i mean this is publishing all over sort of overall isn't it because that kind of reviewing books that publishers seem to think that it, it's enough to just get a copy of the book 
and to get a nice review and a quote for mm. the book or whatever is, is enough to just oh yeah here's a here's a copy of a you know 10 quid book mm. which of course if you're going to review it properly you've got to read the whole darn thing mm-hmm. and you're you're reading it and then providing a review that is going to improve sales and yeah you know make them money and essentially you're doing it for free you're doing it for for you know a 10 quid book that might cost you you know cost you in time several hours and then of course writing the review and everything yeah. so it's kind of i think publishing not just in academia but sort of publishing mm. the world of, mm. of of writing overall it's quite a bizarre one really isn't it yeah i mean one thing that i've also seen come up so in astronomy we tend to have like one person review the paper but um in sort of more mainline physics they will have two or three reviewers um, and you mm. might have two of the reviewers think the paper's fine and then one person might absolutely hate it because maybe they don't like the way it's written rather than the science being crap and so then that will stop it from getting any further mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so there's also this mm. kind of ambiguity about what people consider to be publishable and what you know where people kind of hold the bar yeah yeah, yeah. you know yeah. it's like I would say definitely if I was asked to review a paper, which could happen because I am published now, so I could be asked by one of these journals to review a paper, I definitely would not do as good a job as someone who's been doing it for 10 years purely because I don't have the experience. Mm. You know? So, you know, there's things like that to consider because no one is, like, trained to review papers. It's, you know, something that is just kind of picked up as you go along as you're learning to write papers, but... Yeah, it means that there's mm-hmm. this vast, like, you know, there's this whole spectrum of, of potential reviewers that you could get. So you could get a nice one. You could also get a horrible one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, well, good luck. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hope it gets resolved. I know. Um, so, um, ne- uh, Noctilucent Clouds. I wanted to mention Noctilucent Clouds because have you been seeing them recently? I haven't. Uh, not recently because it's been pissing down in Wales. Oh. So, yeah, all that nice weather that we had is, is basically mm. gone. We kind of get the intermittent odd day and, and that's it. Yeah, I've, I've not seen any just because of um, the high rise state of London. You know, even in the parks, you know, you've got a high mm. horizon. So being able to see those Noctilucent Clouds is quite rare because uh, they generally tend to be horizon hugging, don't they? But um, yeah, uh, but I know there's been a lot of it about because there's been so much on social mm. media. Well, that's right. I'd mention it because it it seems to have become a thing. Uh, I've noticed this year, although although it's been around for years, um, even last year, though you know with that big display we had back in back in June last year, the people were kind of it was just an incidental thing. But this year actually seems to be the first time I've noticed people deliberately going out almost like aurora hunting. I'm going out looking for NLCs no, really? tonight. Hmm. Um, and I, I know people who have who've deliberately planned a night and gone out, and that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for anything else. They are actually they've they've driven somewhere and set up on a hilltop and things to look for NLCs. Hmm. Well, I tell you um, what, lockdown which I makes... just found really. Sorry, go on. I was <laughs> L- say, lockdown. Lockdown. That's it. Yeah. It's, <laughs> people are bored out their asses. <laughs> well, I don't know. I I just think it, it it's it's having its moment. It it's it's becoming the, the sort of summer alternative to mm. to the aurora. You know that that you know aurora is that kind of generally winter thing, and you know you go to Iceland and things like that to to see aurora. And the, here is the summer equivalent. Now this is this is actually a, one of the the kind of things that you do in astronomy is in the summer when it's too dark to do anything else and. And there's no aurora and things. You go not to lucent cloud hunting, which um, there's been loads of pictures online. There's, there's been a lot of displays this year, almost every night. Well, the more the merrier of that. If that's something that people are starting to do now, great. Mm. Um, we were hoping for a nice bright comet this month, weren't we, um, in next month? And uh, I guess we'll have to wait for the sky guy as to whether that's happening. But, you know, in the absence of things that people can pick out that's mm. a little bit different, and as we've been mentioning, the skies, apart from in Wales, of course, the skies have been much better <laughs> recently. So... <laughs> You know, the fact mm. that people are going out and looking at nighttime or evening time phenomena is great. I yeah. think people are definitely yeah. taking up astronomy or at least looking up at the skies during lockdown. Like I've had a lot of, you know, messages from like my friends saying, Oh, my, my parents want to look at this, you know, what sort of telescope mm-hmm. should they get? Or mm. like my cousins texting me saying, When can we see Starlink and stuff like that. So it is nice that people well, are getting a little bit more involved. It's interesting you say that because the other thing I was going to mention was the big debate that's been kicking off on on Twitter and social mm. media and things about Starlink, but not in the sense of Starlink itself, but actually should it be something that astronomy outreach points to? I think so because there's it seems to 
as ever, social media is kind of divided into two camps, and, and they're now at war. Um, and one group seems sort of seeing Starlink as a way of getting people to go out mm-hmm. and, and look up. Um, and there's various people that sort of you know, pushing that. And then you've got the other group was going like, no, that's hypocritical, and you can't say that it's bad for astronomy in one hand, and then go and point everyone to go and look at it, and it, it's therefore evil. Um, and it's just it, I, I I don't know where I sit on it because in a way it's kind of like you a, will come round to my way of thinking soon. Everybody will. I'm definitely up for encouraging people to have a look at it because I think it it's something mm. that's very obvious and that people can see, and then it gets mm. them. It's like a stepping stone to get them thinking like. Hmm. oh those are super bright like is that why astronomers don't like them and yeah. i think it really yeah. does shock people when they see how bright they are compared to the other stars in the sky you know particularly when they're first hmm. launched i think it is a useful stepping stone for them to then understand the argument that astronomers have which is you know they are an issue i mean it's, um, it's an artificial mm-hmm. object but it's still an astronomical object it's in space yeah. and if it's getting people looking up and they're going to be more impressed by that possibly than Sadly, you know, seeing well, you won't see Uranus mm-hmm, and Neptune because mm-hmm. they're too dim. But seeing uh, Saturn in the sky, if, if you don't have some lenses to make it bigger, Sc- Starlink will be far more impressive. The ISS is far more impressive. So getting mm-hmm. people to go out and look and, and get excited about what's up there is is engaging. Because I always see astronomy as being one of those things that just encourages people to become a bit more scientifically aware because it, it is that gateway into science yeah and because it's it's you know it's kind of exciting and it's and it's a bit more showy than than a lot of the mm. other sciences mm. and anything that gets people to to go out and look at what's around and try and understand the universe that we live in even if it's done through artificial satellites that are a plague to astrophotographers but they're really the only ones that are going to be that bothered, putting aside professional astronomers for the moment, Jen, mm-hmm. um, while we wait on the, re- the results of the uh, IAU study. But as, as I see it, you know, for your normal astronomers, how many times have we all been studying fields, um, looking up in the mm-hmm. skies, and heard someone go, God damn it, there's a satellite going overhead? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't happen. Everyone goes, oh, satellite. Yeah. It's, it's, do you know, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm personally pretty agnostic on the whole thing. Um, I, I I see the the kind of problems of Starlink, but you know I've been going out and looking at it and and seeing the trains going over and things and, and thinking, wow, that's actually quite impressive and and quite an incredible sight. Actually, I got my wife to go out and take a look at it, and mm. and she's not <laughs> same, she's not same, even yeah. interested by seeing the craters of the moon through a telescope, but she saw Starlink no. and was like, oh, oh, I like that. That's good. Yeah, no, same. I think the thing with Starlink that really grabs the imagination of people is that human aspect of it Mm. you know is that they can i think they can kind of comprehend a little bit more if you don't have any you know astronomy background at all whatsoever you can comprehend the idea of satellites a little bit more than you can a gal a distant galaxy or a nebula you know unless you've got that little bit of astronomy knowledge you don't really understand what these things are and so then you're kind of like well i don't really get it so i've got no interest in looking at it Mm. whereas you know Mm -hmm. people can if they can see these trains going past on the sky, they can really picture it in their in their mind's eye. You know yeah, that they, yeah. these are things that are orbiting the Earth, yeah. and it just expands their horizon just out to the edge of space. Mm. And then once you've well, got that stepping stone, you can then you know progress to the moon and the planets, and then and then further out again. So to me, as much as I my professional astronomer in me hates Starlink. Um, the the human astronomy outreach person in me thinks that actually they're quite a useful teaching tool. Just as well, because OneWeb's um, taking over yeah. um, Galileo now, isn't it? Yeah, we, we're, we'll talk about this next episode, okay. I imagine. This, okay. is, this is next episode's uh-huh. thing, but it is the OneWeb Brexit GPS system, oh, isn't right, it? Yeah. The, yeah. yeah, and all that. And that that's a whole yeah, other, we'll come to that I, next I think we've got to see how that one pans out anyway, but... Mm. Yeah, but, um, but, you know, but yeah, no, it's great. Uh, do you know what? I think I think we've just proved that we're the grown-ups in this discussion because, frankly, the the war that has erupted on things like Twitter about this over the last few weeks has seen people blocking each mm-hmm. other really? and, and oh, there's been all sorts of things. Sort of various you know astronomy outreach people kind of basically falling out massively over yeah. this and, and blocking each other and having these big spats online. Do you know what? I've um, had a bit of a social media yeah. detox the past couple of weeks. I really I have not been on Twitter. Yeah, I bet you talk feel better I, for it. I do feel better for it. I needed to get away from it. I was getting very overwhelmed. Um, so I've oh. kind of missed all of this. This design for outrage, that's the problem. So you're yeah. always yeah. emotionally yeah. drained. Mm. So, you know, mm. it's 
best to not mm. get engaged or to or to just use it as a nice trolling toy. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Be one of the trolls, but don't feed them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just be, just before we move on from Starlink, have you guys seen the uh, the trials of the laser? Uh, you know, the the, the Starlink uh, are laser linked. That's how they kind of send the data from one mm. to another. Have you seen the the trials of that? on no. YouTube. No, no, I haven't. Take a look. It looks awesome. Oh. So the way they're creating the grid and, and how they use the laser communications between them, um, which I assume has been shown in infrared, because I don't think it's visible light. Um, uh, Wait, laser so link. is the infrared sky going to be covered with like a crosshatch of lasers? Oh, sorry. Yes, I forgot to mention that. That is going to go down like a sack <laughs> <savage thing. laughs> Can you imagine looking at the sky in the infrared and all you can see is, is the a grid. grid from the Matrix? Like... Oh, no, no, it won't be as, as good as that. It won't just be a, a nice, simple grid that you can predict. They're bouncing off one another and going to whichever um, uh, satellite has got the best link. So oh, they, they keep Jesus changing and swapping Christ. between which ones they're going to. It's fantastic. It's so mesmerizing to look at. Uh, oh, and, unless that's just a test before they're doing it as a, a radio frequency, a, a radio <laughs> link, um, then and then even if it's a radio link, radio astronomers are going to be pretty pissed yeah. off as well. No, nobody wins out of this. I, do you know? <laughs> do you know I, I, I'm, I'm predicting that that um, some irate astronomer is is going to probably like stab Elon Musk in a bar somewhere. <laughs> eventually, it's going to be there's 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 a very famous this story of the um, the Duke of Buckingham back in the um, 17th century and he, he was now um, we're talking now you're talking and he, he was stabbed by an irate sailor um, on the street outside a bar because he had been responsible for a, a really botched um, expedition um, by the English Navy at the time and it all gone horribly wrong and this guy had made it back from this horrible expedition where like loads of people had died and starved and killed and all the rest of it and he's, he's basically hunted down the Duke of Buckingham and stabbed him <laughs> just, just got rid of him and, and you can just see that I, I can just yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of history I can see this moment is this sort of irate astronomer just meeting Musk and just like Ugh. I'm not. I'm not advocating that, by the way. But just, it's just you can just see like how angry everyone's going to get about. You, yeah. you see the spats on on Twitter. You think, ah, uh, someone's going to get too angry about this. <laughs> <laughs> just, just... Anyway, okay. So um, emails and uh, first up is Astrocamp and Ralph. You have a reply to a question that serves nicely as an announcement for what's happening or slash not happening possibly happening in September yeah that's right uh, good friend Caroline Freeman emailed us this month to inquire about September's Astro Campus she's hoping to come along with the family for the first time but she doesn't know if we were going ahead with it or not and I know a lot of Astro Camp regulars listen to this show and have been tentatively asking the same question on social media so the unfolding position as it stands is that we know that the UK is getting newfound lockdown freedoms on the 4th of July, which is a double irony for our American listeners that they're painfully aware what happens when you open up social gatherings again during a pandemic, but mm -hmm. also that Britain will be celebrating the 4th of July. That's, a, that's, that's an irony that, <laughs> <laughs> that historians will get. But uh, as it stands, uh, UK holiday and campsite venues will be opening up again. And some people are already asking if this means Astro Camp's going to go ahead in September. Can and I simple just butt in? Of course. Because you're saying UK holiday camps. Yeah. Is this only England? Because I don't know if stuff is opening back up in Wales because we're on a different trajectory. I, d I honestly don't know. But the, the situation doesn't really change because we we don't really know what we're going to be doing with this now. The, the, so the campsite are taking all um, extra safety precautions, as you'd expect. Um, and this, like, like you say, this is a Welsh campsite that might be um, outside the jurisdiction of the English uh, lift uh, in, in, in what we're allowed to do. But... Basically, we want to consult the people of Kundi as it's their village and we'll be risking uh, them by tripling the population for a long weekend. Uh, so until they say that they're happy with this and the law allows it and uh, we'll speak to the local councillor as well before making a decision, we, um, we just don't know where we stand. But it, it's kind of pointless doing this now anyway because the situation is likely to be quite different in September. So... Um, we'll we'll have to do this in in August and give a yes no decision then. Now my suspicion is that we'll be seeing rising infections in the coming months. And while we want to give you the choice whether or not to attend, 
we just can't in all conscience host a gathering that could endanger lives. So it, it's just a case of waiting for a yes, no decision in August when, we, when we'll have all the facts in front of us to be able to make a, a decision. Yeah. Um, but of course, it, it's probably going to have to be quite a different camp anyway, because it will be largely a, um, a, a gathering where people can say, stay socially distanced. So we, we probably won't be having mm. any kind of gathering well we certainly won't be having a gathering in the village hall and having the pub quizzes and and talks and things like that but we may be able to do some other things that enable us to keep um a safe distance um so yeah. you know we've, we've just got quite a bit of thinking to do and a quite a quite a bit of fact gathering to do um and because things change from month to month so quickly in terms of this pandemic um we, we just can't make a decision now or, or probably next month um well no. you know maybe late on next month no, and we'll we'll always err on the side of caution yeah. with this. I think so. Um, just wait and see yeah. at the moment. Okay, so next up we have an email from our good friend Scott Jorgensen um, in Bloomfield, Michigan, USA, not so far from Detroit, which is a weird place. Um, and he says, um, "Hello, magnificent Martians, masters to be, and Jen, without whom our horrific doom would truly be sealed, and also John and Damien for good measure." In this recent edition, 15th of June, 96-2, toward the end, Jen asks us to write in about other podcasts on the general topic of astronomy, which we like. If you get no response, it will be because you tipped your hand about putting us at the top of the list when the invasion comes. But I am old and the world is disease-ridden, unjust, <laughs> and on balance, if you do not hurry, we're rather likely to leave you nothing to invade. <laughs> Perhaps to explain my temerity to actually answer... I have said before that yours is the best astronomy podcast in Northern Hemisphere, and I can extend that to 10 degrees south latitude if you like. Yes, please. <laughs> I like that. Um, uh, that pretty much encompasses most of the world, doesn't it, uh, in terms of population? Uh, my favourite Southern Hemisphere podcast is radically different in format, scope, and delivery. Um, that would be Cheap Astronomy. Mm. If you don't know Steve, you might enjoy chatting. You have at least one thing in common other than the Commonwealth, and that is that he's too nearing the light at the end of the tunnel of his PhD. Well, that's interesting. There you go. But I do not see how you could easily collaborate. The Cheap Astronomy is a short format. Explain this bit of astrophysics to me, please, show where, as it's awesome, as you may have heard, <laughs> is more news commentary orientated in long format with an occasional listener question and, of course, electromagnetic spectrum section recently. Sounds like a great show. We should do something like that. It does. I, I, I hear it's a brilliant show, <laughs> Awesome Astronomy. But you might see a collaboration. I do not. And that would be wickedly cool. <laughs> Actually... I give you a sizable list of podcasts you should not collaborate with unless your aim is to improve those other podcasts by letting your glory reflect off them as sunlight reflects off Phobos. We could do some charity work, couldn't right. we? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, 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 we can scatter out a bit of the glory, yeah. can't we? A bit of the glory. Um, anyway, hoping not to have risen to the top of the traitor list so that my family will not be collateral damage. You're Scott Jorgensen, Bloomfield, Michigan, USA, not so far from Detroit. Mm. Uh, P.S. I love the discussion about um, if the SpaceX launch was exciting or not interesting psychologically. Clearly, Ralph is an excitement absolutist and Paul an excitement relativist. And Jen has a good sense not to get involved in something so subjective. <laughs> yeah. I suppose we are... Do you know what? That's a all... scientist in me. Remain objective at all times. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we are... We, we all are. Uh, both Paul, Ralph and Paul to some extent um, I was excited by my child's first steps and by their walking across the stage to get a diploma but there were millions of steps in between that didn't excite me so much even though they were very nice steps I am Paul on the other hand I've heard Pavan for a dead princess at least a hundred times I still get chills listening to it I am Ralph and often I just look at an event and do, don't evaluate it this time. So I'm Jen as well. <laughs> well, that is no doubt far too much for me. Keep up the good work. There we go. <laughs> Thank I you like very that. much that for that, Scott. Email. Um, yes, well, that I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I think if we were going to um, collaborate with other people, the best way to do it would just be to invite them on the show and have a bit of a chat. Um, and then it's yeah. um, and then it doesn't matter about ruining their format if it's quite a strict one because we're quite <laughs> flexible now. <laughs> infect them with our pandemic like awesomeness we could, <laughs> anyway we could also get right. some of the um some of the spacex fanboys from uh, from youtube on as well oh. so that we could uh, we could get their take on it <laughs> oh god can god, you imagine, can you imagine it <laughs> cool. you, in in between the moments where they shout for their mum to bring them another um kool-aid or something anyway news time
Right then, sure as night follows day, thunder follows lightning, and a visit to the STD clinic follows an ill-judged stag doing Ibiza. <laughs> it is time for the news, and first up, I believe she of the Barra Brief is going all gravy wavy again. Jenny, I am indeed. Uh, first story: I'm going to talk about the latest announcement from the LIGO collaboration, which is particularly fun for me because much of the data analysis on this latest discovery was done by a fellow Cardiff PhD student, Charlie Hoy. Me. <laughs> yeah. So announcements from LIGO about the discovery um, of a gravitational wave signal from deep space, they kind of seem like old hat now. I mean, what's it been? Four years? Five years since it's they made shame, their first discovery? Right. Well, this mm. is the thing. I agree with you. I think it's a real shame that these discoveries just seem a bit like, oh, they found another one. Yay. But they're telling you know. us something new. I know, but like everyone just doesn't really seem to care about them anymore. I mean, for me... The sensitivity of their instruments and the faintness of the signals that they're trying to detect, they're truly unrivaled by any form of electromagnetic spectrum astronomy. Mm. Like, you know, what they're doing is absolutely incredible. But that's not the news story. The news story is that the LIGO collaboration have announced the discovery of a gravitational wave signal. So it's those, you know, ripples in space time caused by cataclysmic events between the densest objects in the universe, black holes and neutron stars. Now, I'm saying that a black hole is dense. I don't know whether you can really say that because it's not like it's made up of anything, but that's how I'm describing them today. But what this gravitational wave signal comes from, they think, is a black neutron star. A what? Whoa! Exactly. A what? And this discovery is leaving even the most decorated of gravitational wave astronomers scratching their heads. So last year, the LIGO, Hanford and Livingston detectors and then the smaller Virgo detector in Italy discovered the gravitational wave signal from the merger of a 23 solar mass black hole and then a 2.6 solar mass something. Now, this smaller object has been dubbed a black neutron star because its mass sits above the theoretical upper limit of neutron stars and it's also below the lowest mass black hole yet discovered. Hmm. This object sits in what's known as the mass gap and causes issues then as to whether it is a black hole or is it some kind of exotic neutron star. Mm -hmm. So if the 2.6 solar mass object is a black hole, then there's no existing theory that can explain how it was formed. But then equally, as theory currently stands, the upper mass limit for a neutron star is 2.1 solar masses. And this is based on the maximum density of neutrons that you can have before neutron degeneracy pressures and nuclear forces are not enough to stop the star collapsing into a black hole. So what this means is, maybe we need some new physics to describe neutron stars that can allow them to be heavier. Mm. Either way, this discovery is very exciting because it really does challenge our current understanding of the most exotic phenomena in the universe and it is absolutely going to lead to some new physics being discovered. This is quite circular as well because this is the kind of stuff that LIGO is for as well, for being able yeah. to not only detect things that, that we haven't been able to detect before but also to be able to analyse and probe what they are. So this should actually give us the answer too. Mm. Yeah, it's an awesome discovery. It's I love it when yeah. they, they manage to sort of... I love this way of science where they find something new and then you have to sort of find the new physics to explain it. I much prefer that to the, like, oh, this physics predicts this thing. Oh, yeah, we've just found it. I mm. love it when they find something and then they're just like, I haven't got a clue what this is. <laughs> like, we need to rewrite the books, guys. Like, well, what what's going on here? Yeah, I love it. I love when physics happens that way round. <laughs> That's very exciting. That's very it's exciting. It's very cool. Okay, moving a bit closer to home with my next story, and I might have to eat my words. Mm -hmm. Ooh. I know, right? So in, in an international collaboration led by Tavisha Dimmer Wadina, astronomers have found that not only was Betelgeuse dimmer at optical wavelengths in the great dimmer of 2019, but also at sub-millimeter wavelengths. Now, if you've been paying attention to the electromagnetic spectrum part of the show, you'll know that these are the wavelengths at which dust emits most of its light. So does this mean that the dimming of Betelgeuse was not due to some great big dust clouds getting in the way? Well, actually, yeah. maybe. So um, the astronomers use complex radiative transfer modelling, which is where they, they get a great big computer um, to simulate the paths the individual photons take as they're emitted by a model Betelgeuse and then as these photons travel through like all the material the Betelgeuse has puffed off until we can then see the light 
with our own eyes or with our telescopes. And this helps us understand kind of what's happened to photons along their journey. And these models point to the dimming um, of about 20% that was seen at these long 7 millimeter wavelengths to be not due to a change in the dust surrounding Betelgeuse, but actually due to a change in the photosphere. So that's the kind of outer layer, the upper layer of the star. Mm -hmm. Now, this could happen. A change in the photosphere could be a change in the radius of the star. So if the surface of the star expanded, then this would lead to a temperature reduction and then you'd get a dimming event. Um, Or you could Mm -hmm. just have a change in temperature and this could be by a churning convective cell suddenly kind of all the material cooling as this convective cell is churning the material up. And if you've got a lower temperature, this would make the star look dimmer. I mean, it's exactly the same, you know, reasoning as with surface of stars sunspots themselves are actually very very bright you know you take a sunspot off the surface of the sun and you put it in the sky and it'd be brighter than the moon but in comparison mm-hmm. because it's so much cooler than um the surface of the star it appears black and so then it you know makes the star look dimmer in that particular region now the radius of Betelgeuse in order to cause this 20% dimming in the submillimeter would have needed to change only by about 10%, which is not that much for a star that's, you know, as unstable as Betelgeuse is. Or if it was a temperature change, it would have been a global temperature change of about 200 degrees or in small patches. So maybe due to these large convective cells that you get on the surface of stars like Betelgeuse by about 400 degrees. So it could be... That's not a lot. It's not a lot. Yeah. It's not significant. No, there isn't a lot for a star. So uh, I might have to say that maybe the answer isn't always dust. <gasps> and do you remember what it was that I said it was right at the very beginning, based on the research that uh, that came out? No, go on. I said that it was down to the two solar minima that Betelgeuse has two kind of solar cycles, and when they coincide every... I can't remember how many years it was... Mm. That, yeah. uh, that it causes that dimming. Mm. So all I can say is, just like with Starlink, I'll just wait until you come along to the right answer that I gave right <laughs> at the very beginning. There we are. So apparently we should always listen to Ralph. You heard it here first, people. Yeah. You heard it here first. I know. <laughs> Can't believe I actually said that. You don't feel it. You don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But it could be dust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Once more with feeling, darling. Say it again. <laughs> right. Anyway, final story. Um, I'm returning, I'm finishing in the solar system and we are landing on Titan where astronomers believe Oh, I love landing on Titan I know, right? Where astronomers believe they finally resolved a long-standing oddity about this very intriguing moon So Titan, largest moon is Saturn and it's a very interesting place because not only does it have a very thick nitrogen-dominated atmosphere but it also has its own version of the water cycle that we have here Mm. on Earth So on Titan, Mm -hmm. there are rivers and lakes of ethane and methane clouds of ethane and methane vapour and then sometimes it even rains ethane and methane Mm. It is the only other body in the solar system that has stable liquids on its surface But something has puzzled astronomers for almost two decades And it's been these weird bright patches on the surface in the Mm -hmm. southern regions of the moon. And they were discovered by radio telescopes here on Earth uh, between the year 2000 and 2008. And when Cassini got to Saturn and it had a look at Titans, Cassini confirms that these bright patches didn't contain any liquid. So the question remained, what on... I was going to say what on Earth, but what on Titan are they? (laughs) So astronomers now think that these bright patches used to contain liquid but are now dried up lake beds. Oh. Yeah, so the terrain in these regions is smooth and it's got a different composition compared to the surrounding regions. And it's really reminiscent of dried up lake beds or sea beds here on the Earth. So on Earth, when the water evaporates, you get these flat, salty regions left behind. Mm -hmm. And this is what astronomers think has happened on Titan and it's kind of left behind some dissolved organic molecules. The other option is that these are newly formed shallow pools of recently fallen rain, but it only rains on Titan like once or twice a decade. So astronomers think that this is pretty unlikely. And this information is actually going to help us unravel like the long term climate evolution of Titan and also help us understand surface features of exoplanets in the coming decades. Oh, especially when we've got the Titan mission. Mm. Oh, yeah, grasshopper. And that's me. I'm looking forward to that. 
Yeah. Right then, what have you got for us then, Ralph? Okay, so uh, my first news story comes... Uh, well, it, it carries on from one of last month's discoveries about how early in the universe's history structure in galaxies formed. And it also shows how much astronomy is being done despite the impact of coronavirus lockdowns and social distancing. We've had an absolute drove coming out this month. Um, because we don't actually know when or how the first stars and galaxies in the universe formed. The Hubble Space Telescope lets us view the universe back to within 500 million years of the Big Bang. So we can try and look for clues or those first elusive stars. Um, a team of European researchers led by Rachna Batawika of the European Space Agency went looking for Population 3 stars. These are the very first stars that were forged from the primordial material of the Big Bang, so hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. The fusion of these elements in later generation stars then made the heavier elements, such as oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and iron. The team revealed galaxies 10 to 100 times fainter than any previously observed by using the massive foreground galaxy clusters to bend and magnify the light from the more distant stars behind them. This gravitational lensing effect allows Hubble to study objects that are beyond its normal operational capabilities and look in 500 million to 1 billion years after the Big Bang. They discovered no population three stars, suggesting that these stars and the first galaxies must have formed not much later but much earlier than we thought. Wow. Because the team have now pushed Hubble well past its expected operational capability, we can comfortably conclude that the earliest formation of stars and galaxies happened much earlier than any current telescope can actually see. So we have to wait for the next generation of telescopes to see the very first stars and galaxies and get that picture of the evolution of the universe that ultimately resulted in us being able to gaze back 13 billion years later. Wow. That is astonishing that they've pinned it down to the first stars being earlier than 500 million years. Yeah, mm. yeah and that means that they and must have they must have exhausted themselves before I was, then That too. is literally what I was just going to say. Yeah, that they must have not only mm. have been mm. created, but, you know, whizzed through their very short yeah. life cycles and, and be nothing left. Mm. But yeah, that is astonishing because then you've not only got those stars have to die... You then have to have the next generation of stars forming, yeah. Because the, those stars that they're seeing are like the second generation of stars. Yeah. Oh, that is so exciting, isn't it? And you know, it's so if cool. James Webb ever does launch, <coughs> it won't. Um, <laughs> but certainly, when the extremely large telescope comes online in um, mm. 2025, this is going to be one of the first things that they start oh. looking for because this is kind of like the birth of it's not the birth of cosmology, but it's certainly the birth of the very it's first materials that led to us. And you know how narcissistic humans mm. are when they're yeah. looking at cosmology. Oh, those pictures of like the first galaxies. Mm. Yeah. They're going to be so exciting. Yep. I mean, they're going to be blobs. They're going to be fuzzy blobs, but my God, are they going to be exciting fuzzy blobs? Yeah, and we'll be able to do the spectroscopy and know what they're made of. And... Mm. Yeah. Anyway, next up for me is the global mecca of particle physics, CERN, which has now come a lot closer to building their successor to the Particle Collider to end all particle colliders, the Large Hadron Collider or the LHC. Um, and because scientists always want their tool to be bigger and more powerful, they're actually not content with a massive LHC. Now they want a 100-kilometer super collider to push the boundaries of what's known about the building blocks of our universe. So the LHC isn't actually the particle collider to end all particle colliders. Physicists want more. And uh, who can blame them? Because the successor to the Large Hadron Collider would be four times larger, six times more powerful, and is expected to cost at least 21 billion euros. And in an underground tunnel near CERN's LHC location outside Geneva, Switzerland, it would smash together electrons and their antimatter partners, positrons, by the 2040. So it's not coming anytime soon, um, but it's being called the Future Circular Collider, or the FCC, and it would be more appropriately named following the Elon Musk convention, I think, of the FLC, or the fucking Large Collider. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you can have that one, soon if you want. Um, but it'll allow physicists to produce thousands of Higgs bosons to study and eventually provide the probing power to search for the elusive theorized constituents of the universe that the LHC just hasn't been able to, such as dark matter particles and mm. supersymmetric particles so and i guess maybe solve this issue of the black neutron star well yeah but I, yeah but i imagine yeah. that that'll be solved well before then I, I imagine it's sitting in the data that they've already got 
I mean, hopefully. Mm. But you never know. Yeah. So while the LHC was essentially going to find the Higgs boson or break the standard model of physics, both of which would be exciting anyway, the FCC takes us into the next frontier of pure science exploration. We have a few solid theories of what it should find, but everything it does find will be new constituents of our universe or weird exciting phenomena that opens up new realms of science. So this is a real step into the unknown. Um, oh, but just just imagine, just the, the thought that occurs to me is like we're looking at sort of 20 plus years into the future this when this goes live yeah mm. think what the world was like 20 25 years ago yeah before the lhc came online oh man you could drink sunny d 20 years ago <laughs> yeah <laughs> there might not be a pandemic in 20 years time <laughs> i yeah, think there'll just be a different but... pandemic in 20 years time <laughs> But just just think of the the, the kind of computing power yeah. and the, the things that they'll oh, be doing in twenty yeah. twenty five years yeah. time compared to now. Looking back twenty twenty five years from net from from where we are now, it's just just oh, it's incredibly exciting. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to think about the developments that are going to be necessary to create these kind of things because HTTP, mm. a, a way of being able to use the internet to transfer things from data centers to data centers, so they could deal with all the data they're going to be generating for the Large Hadron Collider, came out of the development of the LHC. They just needed to be able to mm. transfer data. So, you know, the, the internet as we have it now, not the, the infrastructure, but the, the protocols for being able to use the internet mm. came out of the LHC. So what's going to be needed? You know, what are we going to, what additional storage devices, transfer devices, transfer protocols, computing, processing, that's going to just be enabled by this kind of stuff. Mm. It's so exciting to think about. It's the, the knock-on things as yeah. well as the discoveries. But um, while the decision to pursue the FCC was endorsed by CERN on the 19th of June, it's still not a full green light, and CERN's going to need significant international financial help to fund the project. But at least CERN can go full steam ahead now on designing the collider and proving that it's technically feasible. Let's just get on GoFundMe. Yes. <laughs> yeah, fine. just pop it out, Evan. Yeah. Everyone chuck a quid in. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so the big news story for all of us to cover this month isn't so much about the story itself, but rather you guys want to know what to believe after more tabloid and blogosphere sensationalisation. So, Jen, you particularly want to say something around, did NASA find a parallel universe? No. 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 Right, let's move on. <laughs> 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 yeah, look, I want I want to just cover this quickly. Go on. Um because when we when we put out that shout out on Twitter and stuff for, you know, like questions and comments, we tend to do it about a week before we record. And um like there was a little bit of a theme sort of emerging because uh Chris and Scott Bohr said, um, could we discuss the parallel universe that NASA discovered? And then uh, at Big Heart Pluto uh, made a comment saying you know, silly tabloid journalists doing harm to science and astronomy with sensationalistic headlines, which was referring to this story as well. And um, the story is, is that NASA has discovered a parallel universe in Antarctica where time runs oh, backwards. God. Pew, pew, buzzword, buzzword, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> like literally hitting all of the targets with this new story. So th this story just needs the word quantum in there to complete a full line on the bullshit bingo. <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, but yeah, obviously NASA did not discover a parallel universe where time runs backwards. And what this is is a classic case of um, there's a tiny obscure patch of theoretical physics uh, that has been blown up for yet another sensationalistic headline. Um, and I don't really understand why they do this because space is interesting enough as it is, right? They don't have to make things up to make it more cool. Yeah. I, I just don't understand why they do this. But um, anyway, on the uh, April the 8th, um, New Scientist published an article saying that there'd been some weird results, right, from a neutrino detection experiment in Antarctica. Um, and that that was just kind of it. It was like, hey, hey, hey we've uh, found some weird stuff. What do you think about this, guys? Um and there is a separate, you know, paper somewhere out there, uh, which is a speculative model saying that um, this could be the sign 
these weird neutrinos that have been found of uh, an antimatter universe expanding in the opposite direction, yeah. sort of backwards from the Big Bang, oh, right? God. And so the press got hold of this, and I like they were, like had all the cocaine and went absolutely <laughs> ape with it, right? Because we ended up with like a backwards space parallel universe, right? It was like the eighties all over again, where all the journalists were coked up. <laughs> oh God, yeah. But, like, the long and short of it is, no, there is no backwards parallel universe um, because these weird super fast neutrinos, which are really high energy, have been, you know, that have been found, um, they are anomalous, but it doesn't mean that we need new weird physics to explain them because the authors of the paper, they haven't even exhausted kind of all the physics that we know about yet to try and explain these high energy neutrinos, um, let alone inventing a parallel universe to explain them. You know, they haven't even fully ruled out that it was something weird going on with the experiment in the first place. Um, this is kind of the equivalent of seeing a light in the sky, a pinpoint light in the sky, and before you exhaust Venus, the moon, Saturn, a flare, yeah. mm. jumping straight to aliens. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly what it's like. It, it's just there happens to be some weird theory out there, right, about parallel universes that has the slightest tenuous connection right to these weird super high energy neutrinos that have been found and then the journalists have added two and two together and then got a smallpox infested chicken out of it right i just um, yeah. even the authors of the study don't understand how this like connection was made because none of the authors on this neutrino paper are any of the authors on this, you know, parallel universe theory paper. <laughs> so basically, no, it's loads of crap. Yeah. Once again, proving the maxim that you should never trust a tabloid science story uh, ever, yes. ever. And and it, it, it's the Douglas Adams thing, isn't it? Isn't it enough to see that the garden is beautiful without having to believe that there are fairies at the bottom of it too? Yeah, yeah. yeah. As this is the astronomy episode, we should probably talk about astronomy that you lovely people out there in podcast land can do yourselves. And this month, we're going to talk about that rarely viewed from northern climes, zodiac constellation Sagittarius. Now, this is one of the, the oldest constellations, and it was thought to depict the half-horse archer, the god Nurgle for the Babylonians. And this centaur-like vision has stuck fast through various iterations on ancient cultures. For the Greeks at different times, it was seen as Chiron or Krotos. Um, and there's a nice sky story that the arrow of this Sagittarius points towards Antares, which is the heart of Scorpius. And should the scorpion ever try to attack Hercules, he will avenge Scorpius's slaying of Orion by letting fly. So let's get to actually know the constellation. Jenny, give us the lowdown on the horse arsed bow plucker. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I, I, I can't. I have no way to connect that with what I've written. <laughs> I try to be very sensible with my descriptions, but whatever. So, Sagittarius, it's the constellation that really marks the centre of the galaxy. So, for those of us at northernly latitudes, Sagittarius reaches its highest point in the southern part of the sky in July, August and September. But guess what? If you're south of the equator, well, you know, not too far south anyway, you can see this constellation too right now. So look at us being all nice to our 12 <laughs> Southern Hemisphere <laughs> listeners. Penguin fanciers. <laughs> <laughs> we can use the fact that Sagittarius is close to the centre of the galaxy to help us find it. So in dark skies, you should be able to see the band of the Milky Way stretching overhead. And the thickest part of the band marks the centre of the galaxy. Near here, you should be able to see the classic asterism of the teapot, which marks the central parts of the constellation of Sagittarius. And the spout of the teapot actually points directly towards the galactic centre. So there you are. That's where Sagittarius is. Hmm. And Sagittarius currently has 32 stars known to have exoplanets around them, and it's looking towards the centre of our galaxy. So a whole heap of glorious deep sky objects from mm. open clusters, dark clusters and globular clusters to nebulae and elliptical galaxy. And of course, it's home to the supermassive black hole that us and everything in the Milky Way orbits. Plus a couple of spectacular visitors that Jen will take you through in a bit. But as this time of year it doesn't get dark enough to observe faint deep sky objects until midnight, I'm going to pick out a couple of standout objects in Sagittarius and concentrate on the Omega Nebula and the Sagittarius Star Cloud. 
So we'll start by drawing a line between the brightest star in the constellation Scutum, Alpha Scuti, and Polis, the star directly above the lid of the teapot of Sagittarius. Halfway along that line is Messier 17. Now only the best nebulae have multiple names, and this one is also known as the Omega, or the Omega if you prefer, the Swan, the Horseshoe, and the Checkmark Nebula, among a whole raft of other catalogue designations, and can actually be seen as a companion to last month's Eagle Nebula in binoculars, which is a fantastic view to take a look at. At 11 arc minutes wide, this nebula is 5,000 light years away and 15 light years across. To us, the nebulosity caused by gas being energised by hot young stars is just beyond naked eye visible, but an easy binocular target. A small or medium scope will reveal a rich gas and dust complex with a bright streak caused by those energetic young stars. Now, from the Amiga Nebula, drop your view half the distance towards Polis above the lid of the teapot and settle on a really rich star field, so dense that in binoculars you're looking at over a thousand stars in a region 600 light years wide. This is Messier 24, or the Sagittarius Star Cloud. Often overlooked, it isn't glowing like a nebula or tightly packed like a globular cluster, this is a real astronomer's target. Not just because it varies from the common deep sky targets, but for a whole range of reasons. You're looking deep into the heart of the Milky Way. You can see it as a dense 1.5 degree wide star cloud with the naked eye under dark skies. It has a nice star whose brightness varies as it rotates. It has numerous dark streaks of interstellar gas and a couple of faint planetary nebulas. In this single spectacular object, the width of three full moons, we have almost everything the deep sky can offer. It's great in binoculars and a large telescope or astrophotographic images let you scan for everything with incredible detail. But if you have a telescope or a pair of binoculars, make sure you take a slow scan around the whole constellation because it contains the richest trove of stars and deep sky objects anywhere in the night sky. Okay, Jenny, then what about the solar system? Well, I am very happy to say that planets are starting to play ball again. Yay! So the latter half of July presents great opportunities for viewing Mercury and Venus in the pre-dawn sky. Of course, these inferior planets, they never stray too far from the sun, so always be careful when you're hunting them down. Venus is going to be particularly spectacular, um, as it has been for a little while now, because it's going to be at its brightest on the 10th of July at an astounding magnitude, get this, minus 4.7. Ooh. Wow. Very bright indeed. What? And we also have greatest western elongation coming up on the 13th of August, which means we're going to have a couple of weeks where it's like really bright and also very far away from the sun, which means that it's going to be pretty easy to spot. Mm. And Mercury reaches greatest western elongation on the morning of the 22nd of July, and it's going to be 20 degrees away from the sun, which is going to be your safest opportunity to see Mercury. So, you know, go for mm. it. Have a go at trying to find the two inferior planets. It's probably the best month to try and see both of them. But I'm warning you now, you're going to have to prepare for a lot of, did I see an alien this morning? <laughs> Comments, because... <laughs> These planets are going to be so bright and so obvious that people are going to be like, oh, did I see a spaceship in the morning? <laughs> and then you can be like, no, actually. And point them towards this podcast where they'll hear me making fun of them and never listen to it again. <laughs> so Mars is brightening as well um, as we head towards opposition in October. Um, it's still a late night, so you know we're talking after midnight or early morning object. But Mars is going to be making its way through Pisces this month. And it's going to be close to the moon on the night of the 12th. Um, although, to be honest, by the 12th, it's well below magnitude zero. Uh, it's going to be one of the brightest things in the night sky. So it's going to be easy to spot without the moon. But you can always use as the, the moon as a guide on the 12th if you're not sure where to find it. But for me, the real stars of the show for July are Jupiter and Saturn, mm. which are visible in the evening sky. And funny enough... They're in the constellation of Sagittarius. It is almost like <laughs> we planned this. Almost. Do you think? Do you think I actually put some thought into which constellation I picked? <laughs> so, no, I did almost. So Jupiter's at opposition on the fourteenth of July, um, and although it's not going to be you know terribly high in the sky, it's going to be very bright and very obvious. And Saturn's opposition is on the twentieth of July. So together, these two gas giants, they're going to be putting on a great show in the evening yeah and then on the night of the 6th there's going to be a great conjunction of the moon with jupiter and then of course saturn so that's something to look out for as well 
So Uranus is in Aries and is visible in the morning sky and Neptune is in Aquarius and is also visible in the morning sky, but you are going to need telescopes to be able to see these. They're not naked eye visible. Now, Neptune is going to be at its brightest for the next few months. So July is actually shaping up to be a really great month for planets. And if you think about it, if you've got like a medium sized telescope, you have the chance to see every planet in our solar system in one night. How many people can say they've done that? Not me. I have. I haven't. I haven't done it. I've never seen them all in one go. No, I've done that. It's something that's on my tick list. So um, uh, Mm. July. Mm. And July is definitely a good month to give it a go. As long as the skies are clear, you're going to have loads of opportunity to do it. Yeah. Cool. So there you go. That's That's my thing to do this month. Okay, so for the meteors this month, we have four meteor showers. But don't get too excited. Three are and the other one's barely average. <laughs> so now your expectations are suitably lowered. The first one of the month peaks on the 21st of July with a whopping one meteor per hour under ideal Ooh. conditions. Oh. Pushing the boat out there, Ralph. Jesus. Well, we're treating you this month. Mm. <laughs> oh. Quite appropriately, we think the 49 Andromedids come from a barely visible periodic comet C2001W2 batters. My advice, look anywhere in the sky as you'll probably see more sporadic meteors than by gazing towards Andromeda during the peak. <laughs> Suited batters? To- that, sounds like, that sounds like a teenage insult. It does, not it? Batters, uh, batters that is. <laughs> batters. <laughs> Suitably depressed up there in the Northern Hemisphere? Well, it's your turn next, Penguin Fanciers, with the Pisces Austrinids, where the peak on the 28th of July gives you five times as many meteor showers per hour. Yes, that's right, a total of five. The radiant hey, is just next to the star Fomalot in Pisces Austrinus, the southern fish. Next, we return to the Northern Hemisphere and times by five again for the meteor shower highlight of the month with 25 meteors per hour. Whoa! Heady. That's not too bad. But that, that's right. like perfect ZHR. That's <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. you know, you might if see all things are perfect and, yeah. and it was over your head, that <laughs> yeah, would be okay, that, that's that many But you won't. <laughs> the southern delta aquariids come courtesy of the debris from the breakup of the Marsden and crashed sun grazing comets and peak on the 30th of July. The radiance is in Aquarius above the southern horizon after midnight. And finally, to round off this month's shower, and what a shower it's been, the Alpha Capricornids, <laughs> which return to the safer ground of a more sedate five meteors per hour. The Alpha oh, Capricornids also peak on the 30th of July. Look to the left of Saturn after midnight if you want the honour of being the only person to care enough to observe them. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, we do have some comet possibilities with two comets showing some promise, but we've all heard that before. <laughs> um, so we've got Comet 2019 U6 Lemon, and that's Lemon with two M's, um, and Comet 2020 F3 Neowise. Now, Lemon was showing up in binoculars south of the equator as it dived into perihelion at the end of June. So there's a chance that by the second half of July, as it sort of comes out of the sun's glare and is, is back in the sky again, it might be a nice target. Hmm. It may also have done something else entirely. Um, it'll be in Virgo when it's first picked up, sort of mid- mid-month, passing through the Virgo cluster and then into Coma Berenices by the last week of July. Now, Neowise, different route, hits perihelion on the start of July, um, 3rd, I think, and from the 10th, it'll be in Auriga before tracking through Lynx, Ursa Major, and then on to, wait for it, Coma Berenices in the last week of Ooh. July. Yep, Ooh. we could have two nice comets very close to each other by the end of the month so nice. that's actually quite exciting um, and even if they don't get that bright they're certainly going to be telescope targets they, they will be there so mm. um, that's going to be really easy really interesting to see the images taken night night overnight as they're tra- mm. tracing different paths and they'll be yeah. zipping across the yeah. sky the, so that last part of July they will be in sort of opposite imagine the, the kind of upturned L of Coma Berenices mm. they will be at kind of opposite corners the, the sort of two opposite ends of the L mm. they'll be kind of opposite each other like that so that's really interesting like um, it's sort of yeah um, and th- there's a possibility of, of naked eyeness in theory uh, especially with Neo Wise but as ever nobody's quite sure so hmm. um, so that leaves the moon phases and we start with moon bright skies and a full moon on the 5th last quarter on the 13th new on the 20th and first quarter on the 27th so I wish you clear skies and happy hunting
Now, you lucky people, it's that time again for what is proving to be a very popular part of the show as Jenny once again takes you by the hand and leads you through the next part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Jenny. This month, we're on to the optical wavelength range. And this is the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we are the most familiar with because it's the light that our eyes can detect. Naturally, it was at these wavelengths that we studied the universe for, you know, thousands hundreds of years then with the invention of the telescope until you know first of all we discovered that there was light beyond the visible part of the spectrum and then secondly until we were able to build telescopes and instruments that could detect the other invisible light so as such i thought it might be fun to explore some of the objects in the night sky that most people will be familiar with having either observed them themselves or at least seen some of the spectacular images of these phenomena from the hubble space telescope over the past 30 years and i thought we could delve a little deeper into the physical origin of the light that we are seeing so most galaxies in the universe fit into one of two categories spirals and ellipticals spiral galaxies are easily the prettiest of the two they're full of structure with twisting spiral arms and a myriad of star colors the closest spiral galaxy to the milky way is the andromeda galaxy otherwise known as m31 and from our point of view the andromeda galaxy is tilted at an angle of about 13 degrees so we're kind of looking at it diagonally onwards And when you look at the Andromeda galaxy through like a medium sized telescope, you'll be able to see the bulge or the centre of the galaxy as like a fuzzy ball. And then you might be able to see some more diffuse light around this bright core, which is marred by dark dust lanes. And if you look at images of the Andromeda galaxy, you'll see much more detail and you'll be able to see the spiral arms a lot easier. You should also notice in images that the core of the galaxy appears more yellowish compared to the bluer spiral arms. And this is because there's little active star formation in the centre of spiral galaxies. The core contains older, smaller, cooler stars, and these are typically red or yellow in colour. In contrast, the disk of spiral galaxies, where the spiral arms are, they appear bluer, and this is because spiral arms are where new stars are formed, and therefore where the most massive, hot, young stars live. These stars, because they are hotter, they appear blue. Now, M51 is another great example of a face-on spiral galaxy, and this one's got really very well-defined spiral arms, and optical images of M51 particularly show the dichotomy in the colour of the central bulge compared to the spiral arms. Now, spiral galaxies are typically very flat and thin, and the ratio of the dimensions is not dissimilar to a CD, actually. And a great example of this is the Needle Galaxy, otherwise known as NGC 4565, which is a side-on spiral galaxy as viewed from Earth. M81, on the other hand, is a great example of an elliptical galaxy. Now, elliptical galaxies are big old balls of stars with random orbits that maintain their ball-like structure. And you'll notice that elliptical galaxies are bright in the middle and they slowly fade away at the edges to nothing. And this is because there are more stars near the centre and then less as you move outwards. Elliptical galaxies are typically yellow in colour and they're full of old stars because there's very little ongoing star formation in these galaxies. They just don't contain much gas for which to form stars. And we think ellipticals are the results of the mergers of galaxies. So during these mergers, galaxies burn through much of their fuel for stars and they form lots of stars very quickly. But then that means they've got very little gas left to make stars in the future. And the merger also results in stars from the two galaxies orbiting in all sorts of directions, which is why you end up with this ball-shaped galaxy at the end. The giant elliptical galaxy is likely to be the end result of the merger of the Milky Way and Andromeda in a few billion years. So, while we're talking of balls of stars, let's talk about globular clusters, which are balls of stars, but on much smaller scales. There's lots of these in our galaxy, M13 and M5 being particularly great examples of these. So globular clusters are compact, gravitationally bound balls of stars that formed all together roughly at the same time, and they're generally made up of older stars. You're unlikely to see any hot, young, massive blue stars in these. They're usually found in the halos of galaxies, so that is around the outer edges of a galaxy. Now typically, Globular clusters are billions of years old and they contain hundreds of thousands up to about a million stars. And these will typically be the oldest stars in a galaxy. The stars in globular clusters are really closely packed. The nearest star to the Sun is Proxima Centauri at a distance of about four light years. And the average distance between stars in a globular cluster is about one light year. But near the core, the distance between stars might only be enough to squeeze our solar system in between them. 
So opposite to these are open star clusters, and these might have about a thousand stars in them. Now these stars are very recently formed from the same cloud of gas and dust, and they're very loosely bound together by gravity, which means that member stars can be ejected or lost as they interact with other bodies during their orbit around the centre of the galaxy. Stars in open clusters are generally massive, young and hot, and they'll typically only live for millions of years as opposed to billions. The Pleiades are one of the most famous open clusters, and you've probably taken a gander at the Seven Sisters many times. I'm sure you will have noticed how bright these stars are, because, I mean, the Pleiades are a really easy naked eye object. The stars of the Pleiades are only about 100 million years old, and if you've ever taken an image of the Pleiades, or you've seen one taken by a professional telescope or a more advanced amateur astronomer, you've probably seen an ethereal blue glow surrounding these stars. And this blue glow is a reflection nebula, it's a cloud of interstellar dust scattering and reflecting the blue light emitted by the hot young stars of the Pleiades. The Witch's Head is another reflection nebula. And an interesting side note, this is why sunsets and sunrises are red. It's because the dust in our atmosphere scatters away the blue light from the sun, letting only the red light reach our eyes. There are other types of nebulae too. One of the most famous ones is the Orion Nebula, M42, which is a young stellar nursery and an emission nebula. Now this nebula glows because the light emitted by the newly formed stars is ionising the gas. Now what we mean by this is the UV light emitted by the hot young stars is breaking hydrogen atoms into their constituent parts of a proton and an electron. And eventually these protons and electrons recombine to form an atom of hydrogen. But that atom of hydrogen is in what we call an excited state. And this is no good because the universe is very lazy. The newly formed hydrogen, it needs to lose this energy, and it does this by emitting a photon. And typically, this photon has an amount of energy that places it at the red end of the optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is why in images, the Orion Nebula looks reddish, because of the ionised hydrogen gas. Another type of nebula is a planetary nebula, and the Dumbbell Nebula, or M27, is a great example of this. The name planetary nebula is a bit confusing, because these nebulae don't have anything to do with planets. And much like emission nebulae can be seen because the light from the hot young stars is ionising the gas, planetary nebulae are also glowing ionised gas. This time, the glowing material was puffed off during the last stages of life of a small star like the Sun. Eventually, this lost material reveals the hot glowing core of the star, a white dwarf. The white dwarf emits UV radiation, which ionises the material by causing atoms to lose electrons, which they regain later at the cost of emitting a photon to get rid of the excess energy. And so, the puffed off material glows. Different material made of different atoms, with electrons with different energies, will glow at different wavelengths, which is why planetary nebulae are so colourful. And finally, we've got one more type of nebulae to discuss, and that's ones like the Crab Nebula, which is a supernova remnant. Now, these happen when a massive star runs out of fuel to burn in its core, which means then there's no pressure fighting gravity to stop it collapsing. The star collapses, and then it explodes violently, and the high pressures form all the heavy elements of the periodic table, throwing material far out into space. The stellar remnant will either be a neutron star, a spinning neutron star called a pulsar, or a black hole. The Crab Nebula has a pulsar at its centre and it emits a lot of UV light, which again ionises the surrounding gas and causes it to glow. And there you have it. You now know the main features that separate spiral and elliptical galaxies, the difference between open clusters and globular clusters, and the different types of nebulae that you can observe from your own backyard. And now it's time for that bit of the show where we allow you mere mortals to ask a question of the hive mind and hopefully satisfy your curiosity. This month we have a question from our good friend Jeremy Hansen, who is at jhansona7x on that there Twitter. <laughs> and he asks, what are arc seconds? How do we know how far away things are like planets and galaxies? What's the measuring system? Right. Well, I've got an answer here, but it, by all means chip in. Hmm. Of course. People. Um, so and and very much I, I imagine Jenny will chip in here, but um, try and keep us out. Yes, exactly. So uh, my answer is so. So when a sense is three kind of interrelated questions about measuring in the sky. Now to answer the first part, it's probably the easiest bit. Um, so in the way you have meters, centimeters, millimeters. So in the sky you have degrees, minutes, and seconds. Um, so 360 degrees in a circle around the sky. Imagine you, you look at your horizon. Then each degree 
divided into 60 minutes and each minute's divided into 60 seconds. So it's just a smaller and smaller measurement of the same thing. And of course, this is an angular measurement. So it's not a, a flat measurement. So you're putting your ruler down and measuring it as such. It's, so when we say something is 10 arc seconds, we're describing the angle its, its width, as it appears in the sky, makes from the observer's position. So you can have an object, objects of different size and different distances that have the same angular size from our, our point of view. Um, so it's, it's an apparent measurement, of course. So a distant galaxy may be a couple of arc seconds in angular size in our sky, but it's hundreds and thousands of light years across in reality. Um, and a smaller object that's closer could have the same angular size and so on. So it's, it's an angular measurement. So it's not a sort of stick your ruler on it and actually get a proper measurement of what the thing is. So next up, how do we know the size of planets and galaxies? Well, basic answer is trigonometry, um, in the sense that using that old high school trig about sines, cosines and tangents, you know, knowing your angle of arc, you can also sort of work out the dimensions of a triangle that's created. But if you do cast your mind back to those distant maths lessons uh, on a Friday afternoon, then you'll realise that you need a little bit more than just the angle of the triangle. So you need, for instance, you know, to, to work out the hypotenuse, for instance, is you know the longest side and things like that. So the thing we use typically at that kind of stars and planetary distances and things like that is thing called parallax. Um, of course, Earth moves, so we can measure the angle to an object from our position based on the background stars, which appear fixed. So, of course, the um, great demo of this um, is to put your finger out in front of your face at your arm's length, shut one eye and then shut the other but don't move your finger and of course the finger will appear to move depending on which of your two eyes is looking and that's because of course earth moves so um your your eyes represent the two positions of earth each side of the sun looking at the same object from slightly different angles so we can make we know the angle we know the distance that the earth's moved that straight line uh, through the sun so we've got the, the kind of all the information we need plus you know you throw in your sine cosine and tangent depending on what you're doing um, and you should get a, a nice distance um, but of course this is it's pretty good but it's can i just uh, throw a factoid in go for it i love a factoid uh parallax is how gaia is measuring the mm. distance to the stars in our galaxy so yeah. even though it's like a really old school method, it's now being used to produce the most precise maps of the Milky Way. Exactly. And and we've needed instruments sensitive enough because parallax, like Herschel, we were just talking about, Herschel looked for parallax, but he couldn't see it because the instruments basically weren't sensitive enough, didn't have enough resolution. Um, and it's only recently that we've had the instruments that have been sensitive enough to pick up the, the very, very, very minute parallax for measuring the distance to stars. And that's what I'm going to say, that actually this is pretty good, but it does contain some large errors. Um, and in fact, the distance to our, the various planets in the solar system is actually data we've only really nailed down with, with proper accuracy relatively recently. Um, it, it's not something... So if you, you know, go back even to the beginning of the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century, mm -hmm. our, our knowledge of the distance the, you know, accurately to the planet isn't actually um, error-free by any stretch. Um, and then, of course, now we can measure those distances using sort of radio astronomy and using you know, radar and things like that, and of course, spacecraft flights and things like that. We can, we can do these other measurements. But it's based on parallax. Now, this, and this is one where, where Jenny is, is, is far more proficient and, and uh, is, is knowledgeable in this. But once we go beyond that kind of distances of nearby stars and that, that kind of, you know, our area of the, the galaxy, we're then talking about this thing called um, the, the cosmic distance ladder. Um, and this is basically to keep the answer short parallax really only works at shorter distances and by that i mean yeah. you know hundreds and thousands of light years but beyond that it, it doesn't work um and so it but it, what it does do is it forms the first rung of this ladder um and then we need a series of different observations um, about the nature of star luminosity the effects of red and blue shift on spectra observations of supernovae luminosity uh, etc that sort of build up the various rungs um and different distances require different methods but each one is based on the previous measurement so it's kind of sort of um you, yeah you basically use the previous rung to calibrate the next rung exactly so like with Cepheid variable stars, for example, we can use those to measure the distance to the galaxies sort of relatively nearby in the universe. 
Mm. But then we need to calibrate that distance based on maybe parallax or, or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So we look at a Cepheid variable that's near to Earth, get the distance to it from parallax, and we, we look at a bunch of them and parallax them. So we've got a, a, we can then measure their luminosity and their changes in luminosity based on what we know of their distance by parallax. But then we can use the luminosity of those stars in other galaxies to then work out the distances because of the how bright they are, their apparent luminosity and things like that, and, and how it changes. Mm. And and so, yeah, it it's... Um, it, it's worth adding, though, that the further out we go, the more rungs you work up, the greater the errors. Yeah. And, of course, the errors in each method. So each each method has an error, and it builds up. Because you're compounding it. Which means we don't really know exactly. Yeah. We don't really know how far away distant galaxies are beyond a decent... I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not just guesswork, but a decent estimation, mm. essentially, once we get to real... And yeah. that's why if you look on Wikipedia, you'll see distance to galaxies or to distant objects, and, and it'll have the error bars on it. So it will say, mm. give or take 60 million light years, or or give or take 20 light years. Yeah, and, and the further out you'll notice, it will say things like that, like you know, plus or minus 60 million light years. And when you think about the distance from here to the, the Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years, you realise the error bar of 60 yeah. million light years is massive. <laughs> it's like yeah. a huge distance. And it's like, you know, we can use redshift to figure out the distance to galaxies and everything. Um, but then finding the redshift of a galaxy gets more and more difficult the further away yeah. they are because they're so yeah. much fainter. And so the most accurate way to get a redshift is to take spectra of these galaxies but of course the further away they are they're very very faint and we just don't have the equipment to get um, like spectroscopic redshifts of galaxies beyond about a redshift of one which I think is about five billion years into the mm. past and then you're relying on like photometric redshifts and I'm not going to go into what the difference is between the two but photometric redshifts are completely crap compared to yeah. spectroscopic redshifts and then your errors so you might have a redshift of like four or something which is you know 11 billion years into the past 10 billion years into the past but it'll be like plus or minus one yeah so it, uh, you know it's literally billions of light years of error that we're talking about there and i think i think that's what a lot of people don't realize about astronomy is it's still very much a, a science in its infancy in the bigger picture yes. in the in terms of like these as i said the um it, it's you know the if you want to sort of summarise one of the major jobs of modern observation astronomy is it's making this distance measurement more accurate and reducing the errors yeah. in each of the rungs of the cosmic distance ladder. That's basically one of the major, major jobs of, of many astronomers out there is they're basically just working to make this ladder better and less error I mean, prone. I think you really hit the nail on the head there, Paul, by saying how you like young as science astronomy is. And this is what I'm trying to... I hope mm. people will understand by studying the electromagnetic spectrum stuff is that you know all these different wavelengths that we use to study the solar system, uh, the solar system, so use to study the universe. Now, you know, we've only been doing it at some wavelengths efficiently for like forty years. And that's yeah, yeah. nothing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, in in the big picture, you know, the, the kind of what we think of old astronomy, you know, like the Herschels things like that. That really is just like right at the very, very, very start. We're literally we've learned how to use a telescope. And we've, we're seeing stuff, but we don't know yeah. what it is, and we don't know how far away it is, and we, it's literally just purely spotting the objects. And it's only been the kind of 20th century onwards that we've actually been doing the science properly, that we've actually been taking the measurements and getting the, 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 the data that actually tells us what these things are and how far away they are. It's really, really... I mean, it's a... only been 100 years mm. since we knew that there were galaxies outside of the Milky Way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. A hundred years, that's it. Right, never send to know for whom the bell tolls, for it tolls for thee. By which, of course, John Donne meant that no man is an island, being from the school of the obvious in geographical circles. <laughs> and by which I mean that this continent of an episode for which we are part is clod by clod falling into the sea and we are all diminished by its passing. Remember to send us your questions, thoughts and comments by tweeting us at at awesomeastropod or emailing us at the show at awesomeastronomy.com. 
And don't forget that we still hope to run an Astra Camp star party in September, but with everything being so uncertain in the public health space at the moment, we won't be able to confirm a cancellation or green light it until nearer the time. So we'll put out an announcement through all the usual channels sometime in August. So, until our space exploration show in the middle of the month, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod.com or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.